Yo, what's up everyone? How are we all doing? Hope you've all had a, a good day and a good weekend. Sorry I didn't upload, I was uh, I was viewing places, so um, yeah, I had that and so I didn't really get any recording done. But I'm back today with, uh, this was a, an, uh, an American broadcast that was put out during World War Two. I imagine it was just before, just after Pearl Harbor, something like that. And it was just an American broadcast which, which went out to the Allies. Well, which went up to the Americans talking about the Allies so they would know their Allies better. I haven't watched this. Um, I watched like the first 30 seconds to make sure it was a good video for recording. And it looked really good. And uh, maybe it will take us back to a time where we were all a little bit more united. Not simpler times necessarily, but, you know, united times, I guess. Even though it was a world war. Right, let's get into it. This sort of reminds me of, uh, you know, Looney Tunes when it first when it first aired. Hey, back reacting to NFL. He's doing a shit back then, did they? One by the man who made that touchdown. It was won by a team, and every man on the team had a share in winning it. We're playing another kind of a game now. Only this one isn't for fun. It's for keeps. And this game won't be won by any single player either. It'll be won by a team. A team called the United Nations. The ball will be carried by the men in the backfield. The tough little guy from China, Big Joe Russia, John Britton, and a guy called Yank, the four greatest backs in the world. So let's take a look at the men who carry the ball with us. Who are they? How do they live? What makes them tick? This is a great way to look. Like you can tell a lot of thought went into this when they were making it on how to best um, get the message across across to American audiences. Um, it's, it's brilliant the way they've done it. Carry the ball with us. Who are they? How do they live? What makes them tick? Let's start with the one that's toughest to understand. The one we know just enough about to confuse us. John <laughs> Britton. Here's where he lives. A little island no larger than the state of Idaho. <laughs> Half a million people live in Idaho. Ninety-six times that many live in Britain. It's crazy when you say that. The Nazis and the Japs scream about Lebensraum, living space. But there are more people on a square mile of Britain than a square mile of Germany or Italy or Japan. More congestion than practically any place on Earth except the New York subway. <laughs> or the sardine can. <laughs> And that's a clue that explains a lot about John Britton. God, it looks so different back then. Everyone wearing suits. General sense of happiness amongst people. I'm just looking at some of the smiles on there now. Given that... I don't know. Kind of get that, you know... If you, if you didn't know this was necessarily England, you get that kind of early mafia kind of feel. Practically any place on Earth except the New York subway. Or a sardine can. And that's a clue that explains a lot about John Britton. We build front porches on our houses because we didn't want to miss the chance to see our neighbors. But John Britton hides himself in a little box and plants a hedge around that to make sure he doesn't. <laughs> Living that close to neighbors, privacy is part of the pursuit of happiness. And in the sardine can called Britton, they learn to get on with their neighbors. They have to, he's too damn close. That's sure. why they have so little crime in Britain. Believe it or not, even in wartime, the British cop does not carry a gun, nor does the professional crook. And in Just the general lingo that they use, you know, calling someone a crook. I don't know, it's just... I don't know, it brings a good sense of ambience. The cop does not carry a gun, nor does the professional crook. 
And in 1926, when the world heard of this stoppage of work in Britain, that industry, transportation, the whole life of the country had been paralyzed by a general strike, it was still more surprised next day to learn that the strikers were playing football with the cops. <laughs> you can only understand that if you live in a sardine can. Maybe. The second clue to this guy on our team. No part of Britain is more than a hundred miles from the sea. Every day for hundreds of years, years of peace and years of war, John Britton has seen ships sail from his island to the seven seas. That means that whenever John Britton wants to bust out of his sardine can, it's the sea that gets him. He's been busting out for hundreds of years, and that led to Australia, South Africa, New Zealand. I hope Canada, you guys are enjoying this as much as I am, because I'm really enjoying this, man. This, I, don't, I, I just never really thought I'd get the chance to see anything like this, like a World War II um, program. Brilliant. The United States of America. How did John Britton get on our team? Remember 1938? The Yankees won the pennant. Wrong way, Corrigan. The last trains ran on the 6th Avenue L. Well, John Britton got excited about the same sort of things. The bet he had on the Derby, or, as he would say, the Derby. <laughs> his job. His kids. Getting his exercise on his day off. Preston North End taking the football cup. Preston, eh? Still going there. Only 300 miles away, people were cheering another kind of event. And in London and every other British city and town, they read about what was going on in Europe, and they got sore about it. But yeah. they were also pretty well determined to keep it none of their business. Then, this looked bad. The Czechs had a mutual assistance pact with France, and France had one with Britain. This might mean war, even though everyone was anxious to avoid it. They'd been through one war, perhaps been wounded. Hundreds of thousands of their brothers and friends had been killed. There was nothing beautiful to them about war, and they had no desire for another. In the last desperate effort to preserve peace, the Prime Minister today flew to Munich. All was well. Britain, France, Italy, and Germany were signing a pact at Munich. A pact in which the Germans agreed they had no further territorial claims to make. It was to be peace. Isn't it crazy? Sorry, just watching uh, just watching Hitler there. And it's it's so weird that he just like he looks and acts like a, just a normal dip, like a normal guy. But to us now in hindsight, we know you are like the pinnacle of evil. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just weird. Like for, if you'd never seen a picture of him, you'd imagine you'd imagine him to have a pitchfork and devil horns. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's just weird to see him being him. Italy and Germany were signing a pact at Munich, a pact in which the Germans yeah. agreed they had no further territorial claims to make. It was to be peace in our time, but it turned out to be a strange sort of peace. Hitler's first move was to break the pact he had signed. Wishful thinking was ended. Now they knew something had to be done about Germany. They approved the Conscription Act, the first peacetime conscription in British history, just as the Selective Service Act was the first in American history. The British had put their cards on the table. They had, in effect, said to Hitler, that's enough. If you go into Poland, we'll fight. <laughs> Hitler smiled. Like other would-be conquerors of Britain, Philip of Spain, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, he thought he understood the British. He didn't. The sleeping lion began to wake up. <laughs> he was a pretty drowsy lion for the first six months of the war. Yeah, it's true. He snapped <laughs> it's true. Growled. Drop 
more leaflets than bombs. He hoped that common sense would return to the German people and that they would throw out Hitler and the German warlords. Yeah, I think that's a good um, a good example of how desperate Britain was not was just to not go to war. You know, business was relatively good at the time. There was steady growth in the economy. There was, you know, kind of reaching outward beyond the, the borders of Europe for trade. I know that had been happening for a while, but, you know, with the invention of, you know, technology, trade was trade was booming at the time. You know, I think this is... And then and then this comes up and it's like, well, <laughs> to be fair, it was booming for everyone except the Germans, so that's probably where the problem was, but you know what I mean. Instead... At dawn this morning, the German armies, without warning, invaded the neutral countries of Luxembourg, Holland and Belgium. of the Belgians today surrendered his armies of more than half a million men. Marshal Pétain, as French chief of state, has asked for an armistice. The issue in France is ended. Britain was alone. Czechoslovakia occupied, Poland defeated, Denmark gone, Norway gone, Holland, Belgium, France gone. Only Britain now. Britain was alone. Okay, imagine like, imagine how scared you'd be as like the average British Britain back then. You'd be like, any day now they're coming, any day now. Obviously, you know that you know the military was there and that, but the sense of loneliness there must have been astounding. Hitler considered the war over. Everybody considered the war over except the British. At the eleventh hour, the lion was finally aroused. <laughs> Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. Big Churchill fan. For a year, they took everything that the Nazis could throw at them. For one solid year, from June 1940 to June of 1941, they were the only major power fighting the greatest war machine in the world. Now, we spend a lot, just in case she was interested in like, British education, we spend a lot of time on that, that year in our history talking about, not, not things that you probably expect either, no. we, we do focus on the Battle of Britain, but we just focus on life in Britain in general at the time, the, the rations, um, how valuable women workers were at the time, um, advancements in technology like radar and stuff like that. We, we we discussed that quite quite a lot, which probably as you'd expect. They took body blow after body blow, solid punches before they even had their guard up. All they did was take it on the chin and hang on to the ropes. They never went down. Look at that, smiles and laughter. They never went down. And while they buried their dead, they prepared grimly and defiantly for the day when they could strike back. There were no victories to cheer them on, just defeat after defeat. It's worth noting that the women workers were quite proficient because, you know, a lot of them had already, 20 years earlier, had done the exact same thing in World War One. Um, you know, so a lot of them were ready for it. Some heroic, like the beaches of Dunkirk, or like the hills of Greece, where British soldiers landed to keep their pledge of honor to the Greek people. Landed knowing they were facing overwhelming odds. But some less glorious. Hong Kong. And Singapore. And Burma. But through all these long months, the British people were thinking and planning and working only for the day when they themselves could take the offensive. And that day came.
crazy to see actual footage. in greater and greater strength that's in the air and on the ground it's unbelievable just seeing footage from this time i don't think you can put a price on how valuable it is it's it's brilliant I, i'm almost in envy of people in like a hundred years time who can look back at this time period with such accuracy given the technology that we have now um you know there hasn't you know say they were looking at i don't know desert storm or the Iraq War or something, they're able to look back and see in-depth footage of what technology and people were like 100 years ago. Um, yeah, that's given if, you know, we're still here in 100 years. <laughs> Found 1,500 miles away in North Africa. I didn't think it would involve this much actual footage. So it's a little bit loud. It's a brook. Shout out to the Australians for that one though. Jesus, they really mapped out the whole way to Africa, didn't they? <laughs> You know when I hear church bells like that, you know when like a sound brings back a memory? I don't know if, if you guys would have seen it, but Disney, done a, uh, you remember the old Robin Hood film where everyone's animals? Like Robin Hood's a fox and King Richard's a lion, stuff like that. That's what church bells always remind me of, I don't know why. I don't even know why I brought that up to be honest. Once more the people of Britain heard their church bells ring. More than three years earlier, they had been warned that this would be the signal of invasion. But long since, the nightmare of the threat of invasion had passed. Now the bells rang out a song of thanksgiving, a song of victory. Hey, no offence to this guy, but I feel really bad saying it, but he kind of reminds me of the, um, 
you know one of the goblins at Gringotts? <laughs> you know, Rebutter, you can't, he, I don't know why, he's just kind of, he kind of reminded me of that. simple truth about Britain. But the fellow that calls the signals on the Axis team knows his only chance of winning is to split our team up. So his team plays a game at which they've had a lot of practice. A game which has conquered half a dozen countries for them. A game called Divide and Conquer. Men like these tell the British we aren't taking the war seriously. They tell the Russians we are letting them down. They tell the British the Russians will sell them out. And they tell us... It is manifestly ridiculous for the warmonger Roosevelt to tell the American people that they have anything in common with the British. On the contrary, they are different in every respect. Well, there are differences, that's true. For instance, we drive on the right side of the road. <laughs> but in Britain... We go for baseball. They have a little number called cricket. Hey, just to let you know, I know more about baseball than I do cricket, and I know nothing about baseball. But cricket, I've, I've just never understood the appeal. I mean, let's just go back and just see this clip of this cricket match. They have a little number called cricket. And that shit goes on for days. It goes on for days. Like, you go, well, what's the score? Oh, well, it's 42 runs to 69 wickets, and it, we were... What? Oh, I, I just ain't got time for it, man. Very well played, sir. <laughs> what the... What the... Why is this guy not fuming? <laughs> Very well played, sir. <laughs> Anyone who ever drank coffee over there knows why there'll always be an England. Is your coffee all right, sir? <laughs> I wonder why that is. Is there a different? Uh, must just be different coffee brands. I never. I guess we're just more tea specialists. I guess that's what the joke is. Have you heard about it, boys? Give us another glass of half now. Blimey, you'd have thought it happened to poor old Bill and another bloke here. So I went in to suck my dinner. And I was getting swatch. He that's bad. smaller piano fort works are past. Are they kidding, Jack? Why the cockamamie sprinkling from schmaltz mixed with celery tonic? They all so much with corn cone in their mouth. You all can't understand a word they say. Yes, there are differences. You know, I I love the differences that we have in, in countries like why would you not love that? I love that I don't understand everything American. I love that Americans don't understand everything British. I think it's what makes us great. If we were both exactly the same, then there'd be no interest in learning about one another anywhere. But clips like this, that's brilliant. You all can't understand a word they say. Yes, there are differences. But there are a few things that Britain and America do have in common. And these are the important things of life. A little thing called a free representative government. We call it Congress. They call it Parliament. A little thing called freedom of speech. No, in the next war, you've not got to go to it. They'll bring the war to you. And the thing is, if you take it from me, go and live at the Dorchester. Because <laughs> the trenches are just outside. This meeting is called on the Office of the American Workers' Party, an organization dedicated to the organizing of the working class of America. Freedom of the press. Freedom of religion. They may not be important to Hitler, but all these things are the common heritage of John Q. Public and John Britton. 700 years ago, their ancestors fought for the Magna Carta. No one will we deny or delay right or justice. 300 years ago, the petition of right. No man shall be compelled to yield any tax without act of parliament. These principles came to our own country with the earliest settlers and yeah. from them developed Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble 
We may make gags about each other's accents, but we speak <laughs> the same language of freedom. Even during the American Revolution, when we were at each other's throats. You know, this is this is probably one of the best videos I've ever watched ever. This is amazing. It was just 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 the feel good aspect I've got from it. Now I hope you guys feel the same. But this is such a feel good watch. It's almost like a, an old Christmas movie or something. Even during the American Revolution, when we were at each other's throats, the Earl of Chatham was free to say about us to the British Parliament, You cannot but respect their cause and wish to make it your own. And that is why in the heart of London, alongside his great naval hero, Nelson, John Britton has put George Washington. Yep. And in Parliament Square, the most sacred spot in the British Commonwealth of Nations, Abraham Lincoln. Yep. Of course, Hitler doesn't like this kind of. Um, and in I live in Birmingham, and in Birmingham City Centre, there's a a John F. Kennedy memorial, great big statue, lovely statue. I'll take a picture of it and put it on my community next time I go past it. But uh, yeah, man, we, we've got a lot of American monuments over here. Well, a fair few, mostly down in London, to be honest. But they are scattered throughout. His job is to sell the British that we are a nation of money grubbers. And gangsters. <laughs> While in the next studio, he is selling us the idea that the British are gutless and dopes. The John Q. Public and John Britton are entirely different. All right, Hitler. Where are these miners? Pittsburgh? Wales or West Virginia? Uh. These farmers. Devonshire or Wisconsin? <laughs> these steel workers. Sheffield or Pittsburgh? These oh. children, American or British, they live in lands which share the same hopes, the same ideals, and unlike the poor children of Germany, in lands where the truth is free. Let's not kid ourselves. Britain is not the United States, and the United States is not Britain. For instance, we don't go in for this kind of thing. <laughs> <They do. laughs> I've never really understood that, if I'm completely honest. We don't go in for this kind of thing. They do. But there's no mystery about that. Remember our grandmother's house? It was old-fashioned, out of date, patched and altered to suit each new generation and filled with family relics even grandmother couldn't explain. Well, John Britton has been living in his house for a long time. And that's why to us, who live in a modern house that we built ourselves to suit ourselves, John Britton seems slow moving and cluttered up with ancient traditions. Kings, for instance. The present king rode to his coronation in the same coach, to the same church, for the same ceremony as his ancestors did. But the job he took on is very different from theirs. There have been some changes made. King the British George. king can no longer make laws or impose taxes or interfere with government. He and his family work as hard as any other citizen, doing the job that the people expect of them. Today, the king is the servant of the people and not its ruler. When an American is arrested and brought to trial, the bailiff calls his case. The people versus John Doe. But if such a case were called in Britain... What? Well, I, 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 hate... <laughs> I hear that term a lot. What? What is John Doe? Yeah, I've heard that quite a few times in American films and stuff like that. So if you wouldn't mind, just pop that down in the comments. Case. The people versus John Doe. But if such a case were called in Britain, it would be... The king versus John Doe. It means the same thing. Today, the British king is the symbol of the people. The British are great fans of the fellow in Buckingham Palace, but when they sing, God save the king, they're not worrying about his health. They mean, God bless the British people. And the dukes and the earls? But in 1911, the people took away the last remaining power of the lords to block the action of the people's representatives. Sorry, guys. Dukes and earls... Oh, that little on me. and the earls, but in 1911, the people took away the last remaining power of the lords to block the action of the people's representatives. Yeah. Dukes and earls don't run the country anymore. 
Today, there are only two people who do that. John Britton and his wife. <laughs> they... Is that a fella? Dressed and up? His wife. Oh no, just kind of They go to the polls, butch just woman. as Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Public do here and elect their representatives to the House of Commons. And there they fix the taxes and make the laws. And if John wanted to get rid of the Lords, his representatives in Commons can at any time vote them out of existence. But John doesn't want to get rid of them. So he confuses us by keeping Dukes and Lords in a country where... Unions have long been accepted as yeah. an essential part of the democratic system, where the Labour Party, controlled by the unions, is one of the two great political parties, where longshoremen and railroad engineers have been ministers of the Crown, and where for 30 years he has had a system of social security even more extensive than our own. So when you read about Lord Lewis Mountbatten or Lord Beaverbrook, former head of aircraft production, don't think they got their jobs because of their titles. No. They got them because they were the best men for the jobs. Just as Ernest Bevan, formerly a labor leader and now a member of the War Cabinet, Herbert Morrison, who started life as an errand boy and is now Minister of Home Security, got their important jobs because they were the best men for them. With the things on the surface, the unimportant things, their John Britton and our John Q. Public differ. But the important part of their lives, they run the same way. The democratic way. The free way. I'm going to have to stop it there because with my speak, and this video has probably ended up being about 30 minutes, but I'll, I'll release the other, the other half as soon as possible. I just don't want it to get copyrighted or there to be problems with it because I really enjoyed this and I, I do actually want to get it up. But um, I really hope you guys enjoyed that much as I did, man. I That's arguably one of the best videos I've watched and I'm I'm going to go ahead and record the other part literally as soon as I stop this one. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it, man. You know, like, comment, subscribe, man. It really helps me out. And, uh, you know, it do me a massive favour, man. But I appreciate it. Um, take it easy, guys, and I'll, I'll see you in the next clip.